Hello, and welcome to Coast to Coast, Real Women, Real Opinions from Sea to Shining Sea. My name is Jenny Lee, and I have with me Miss Mary. Hi. And Miss Emma. Hello. And this is our special, we're not sure how many parts yet, series <laughs> on the Nixium trial, because it's still ongoing. And we want to make sure that we cover um, as much as the actual testimony as we can for you. So um, in, in the previous episode of Coast to Coast, we covered the first two and a half days of the Nixium trial. Uh, and just to recap real briefly, Nixium um, was a super organized sex cult um, where people were enslaved uh, and collateralized. They were, they, were, they were brought in to bring collateral to the table so that they would be able to keep them in slavery. What was actually so clever about this cult was people actually came into it quote unquote voluntarily and, um, and were kept in and asked to bring other people in. We heard from Sylvie, her testimony, we heard the testimony of Sylvie who talked about how the enslaving process occurred. And we heard uh, from Mark Vesante, at least partially, um, we only made, made it to lunch in day in day three. Um, it's a very, very action-packed trial. Uh, it's not being covered by the mainstream media at all. Um, very, very high-powered people involved. Very, very uh, tentacles stretching throughout the world, global tentacles. To this organization which had spin-off companies and um it's a very 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 big deal and and nobody's talking about it but us right and in addition you know i had asked raised the question when was nexium founded to see how long it's been it's been swirling and it was and we're seeing that it was founded in 1998 and i wanted to uh reiterate that at that time the president was clinton and mm -hmm. that uh, that tied into what was discovered that Nexium was told he, that he wanted his cut. And when they didn't get an agreement on that, suddenly they were shut down by arming the federal law enforcement agency's arm that Clinton had direct point to. But that so. happened when um, when Clinton was the governor of Arkansas and Keith Renner had started up his very first pyramid. Scheme. Oh, that was earlier? That was earlier, but Nick, that was the CGI company back when um, he was applied pressure when Clinton was governor of Arkansas. But what you're talking about was when Nixium was started, which is a completely different company than CGI. Um, Nixium, the one that we're talking about now, was started in 1998, and by then Clinton had become the president. Okay, so I'm not sure when CGI was uh, was launched. Um, well, that would be back in the days of when Clinton was the governor. governor. Okay. I'm, I'm checking. I'm checking now to see if I can find anything. But of course, it's not going to be that easy. Well, that's okay. So we were at the lunch break um, and we came back and the portion that we started to get into was videos of Keith. Mark Vincente was a filmmaker. He's uh, most well known for What the Bleep Do We Know? Um, and he did a lot of filming of Keith. Keith loved to film himself all the time because every word that came out of his mouth was magical. They believe that his, uh, he, he lost a lot of computers. Uh, they believe that his energy was just so overwhelming that he had the ability to uh, short out computers. Uh, there were also rumors of when he, he was walking with this one woman and it was raining, but it only didn't rain on him because he was such a mythical beast. So that's how much highly he thought of himself. So the videos of Keith and his sex lair get introduced. And Mark Vincente took these videos. And you get your first live look at them in, in his man cave discussing Sarah Edmondson. Um, she was Allison Mack's slave. Uh, but she was allowed to get married. So Sarah Edmondson's wedding photos. Sarah was the first to bravely show the world her branding and help lead others out before they were also branded. 
Um, according to the Washington Post, I believe is where I got this from, the video starts out with Rainier admitting he hasn't read many books in the library and then making crude comments as he looks through wedding photographs in a photo album of the two Rainier followers. Keith designed their wedding vows. This is Keith. These are quotes from Keith. Did you notice one in the crowd shots, the woman isn't wearing panties? Rainier asked the group gathered by the study for the film. He calls women piggies. He says to tease a woman about her odor, to say she's official, it's official, she's official. Rainier said to the camera. So Mark goes on to explain how Rainier would give different meaning to everyday words. So official now became a woman's fish hole. Mm. Um, he, he made jokes about people fucking sheep and goats. I'm just going to use the words that are being used. Well, those are, and, and, and you qualify that in that those are the words being used in the These are words being used. I, Yeah, I have to keep it. He answers, the, he answers the phone call when the phone rings in a chair saying, lick me. Um, he belches and gives a finger to the camera. Good guy. At one point, Rainier lays down in the middle of the room, but did not take off his glasses. He says, if I take my glasses off, I get sleepy or horny. He told me he did lots of things laying down, Vincente testified. We're now up to May 14th, and the trial was canceled due to a juror getting sick, and we're about one week into the trial. Um, oh, in between, they had different days off. So, like, if you had a five-day week, there may be two days where they were hearing um, test, hearing about whether certain evidence could be admitted or not, or taking care of other things. Um, this is an important piece. So this was this was the one day that they started hearing about whether evidence could be submitted, and this one's really hard because it's about the abortion records. Mm. Um, so that got really so. So they start discussing on the record with the judge and the attorneys how he's charged with sex trafficking, which removes the consent feature. And he's also accused of possessing child porn and sexually exploiting a, a minor. The prosecution says that he targeted young girls, selecting some for special attention, but this was an excuse. He offered to mentor them, to teach them, and that was an excuse to groom them for sex. Um, and he took advantage of these young women emotionally and sexually. The defendant pretended to be a guru, but he was a criminal. And he drew in followers that put their trust in him, and he used that trust for things that he wanted, sex, power, and control. I think I forgot to take something out when I moved something. <laughs> Among the Randy times discussed in court is that Rainier had sex with three sisters from Mexico. They were entrusted to his care and mentorship by their foolish parents. The oldest was Daniela. He had sex with her a week after her 18th birthday. He was in his 40s then. I believe he was 45. Um, and, how, and how old was the youngest at this point? Well, at this point, I mean, at, so... I think it's Daniela, important to highlight because there's so much pedophilia involved in mm -hmm. this. Well, that's... The, the youngest one at the time that he started having sex with was Camilla when she was 15 and he 15, was 15, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, call. she was the youngest one. He kept, um, he kept, he called Camilla the virgin, but he kept Daniela, he kept her a virgin until she was 18, even though she came to him early. So she started grooming him early, but the other ones, I mean, one of them he took, it did some horrible things here. So they had a sexual relationship. And while he was having sex with more than 20 other women at the time, he told Daniela that she could not have sex with anyone else. She developed feelings for Nixie and Hacker. But they, oh, they had a ton of hackers, by the way. They were very good at hacking, especially um, one of, the, one of the, the, these three sisters. Daniela... Um, wanted to be with Ben Myers, the hacker for Nixium, and Rainier declaring she had an ethical breach without disclosing what it was to the, the community ordered her confined to a room for 22 months. So because she refused to have sex with, with Keith, because she, she fell in love with Ben, her punishment to, was to be confined to her room because she was having an ethical breach until she 
figured out what she needed to do to get out of the room, which was have sex with Keith. By the way, she was not locked in the room. She only believed she was locked. Right. That's that whole elephant chain theory that you Yeah, heard. well, this is how brainwashed they were. Yeah. Um, she finally did eventually escape. She just got up, walked out of the room one day, and went back to Mexico with no ID, no nothing. Um, Rainier had a baby with the middle sister, Mariana. He had a nickname for her. He called her Monkey. She is reportedly now living in Monterey, Mexico with Rainier's son, Kimar. For years, he lived with Mariana and Pam Caffrey. She's one of the women that died from cancer. There were two women that died from cancer, two women that committed suicide. Um, Mariana and Pam Cavritz, Menaz in Clifton Park, telling some in the Nixium community that the women were a gay couple and they merely lived there platonically as a roommate. Oddly, Rainier seems to have impregnated Mariana on or about the same day Pam died of cancer. Uh, sadly, he impregnated Pam numerous times, but he always forced her to have an abortion despite her strong desire to have a child. And she was one of his main um, three girlfriends in the beginning, along with Barbara Boucher, because he had that tight group. And then it was the, the eight, the DOS eight, and then it was the Nixium nine who left. They were part of that. And then that's when they brought Emiliano Salinas and when they started restructuring the top executive group. You know, and this form of polygamy is very much that uh, relates to the polygamy that was being exercised by those in one of his branches that was in Mexico by some Mormons who had left Utah yes. to, to uh, continue their chosen behaviors so they and I, I i can't find the date of that when that was supposed to have happened that that family emigrated but um it's interesting that there's a correlation there and that he went that uh this joker went to that same group to try to mentally manipulate the girls that were in that mexican um the, that mexican family yes uh, hub, right? Yes, that was the one with the uh, the young Mormons, the yep. schoolgirls. Yep. Right. So the youngest of the three Mexican sisters was Camelia. Renier had a name for her too, Virgin Camelia, but he made sure she wasn't a virgin for long. He started having sex with Camelia when she was fifteen. He was forty-five. Oh, New that's that, and I'm going to interrupt also that. That's really important, and it's important for people to understand from a legal standpoint because the the defense is is resting on um, that, this is, that this is all consensual, right? Mm -hmm. Consensual sex. So now we have pedophilia. We have minors involved, and I think these this is where they're really going to hang Rainier out because she was fifteen at the time. Exactly. However, didn't they say that there was something that because there had been a five year gap or something that that was going to be real tricky for the jury? Oh, because it because of statute of limitations. Well, and in addition, the legal age of consent in Mexico is 12. Yeah, but they weren't, they in, weren't Mexico. in Mexico, right? They were in the United States when this happened. But you watch them try to insert into the testimony something to say that they're knew that that whole relationship was actually first performed in Mexico. Watch that try to be slipped in. Well, they're still going to get him on the porn because the nude photos of her, which will be submitted in evidence when she was 15, taken by Rainier, will be hard for the defense to explain away. Yeah, and I think it's good that we get that into um, our communication because a lot of people do not realize that Mexico, that age of, of consent at 12 years old, with the number of people that are moving here illegally. Oh, yeah. They're not, they're not, briefed on the fact that you know that's not our that's not our way that's not ours uh that's not our customs mm. so then there was the dos slave nicole an actress in her 30s she was the slave of allison mack she believed she was joining a women's mentorship group when she joined dos well that's how janessa advertises itself yes that's exactly how janessa and janessa is kind of like 
it's almost like a, a filtering area to find out who you can bring into dogs. Right, right, exactly. Right. Yeah. It's like a grooming, it's like a grooming. So they go there and then the elimination round, they refer back to. Right, right, exactly. right. Exactly, exactly. They make it to the next level. Once in DOS, with collateral held over her, she was ordered by Allison Mack to meet Rainier. This is Nicole. They met in a room where she was blindfolded and Rainier tied her to a table. Then a third person, someone Nicole didn't know, came into the room and started performing oral sex on Nicole, and Nicole felt she couldn't say no. That third person, Nicole never found out who she was, but the third person was Virgin Camila, now age 26. We also know that Rainier had sex with a large amount of people. Many of them got abortions, dozens of abortions, in fact, his defense attorney admits. How many men do you know who had multiple women who have had dozens of abortions? Crazy. Uh, Lauren Saltzman, and her testimony is going to be coming up after, um, I believe, after Marx is over. She wanted to have a baby. In fact, Rainier promised her an avatar baby. He would call them avatar babies. One that would be a world savior. But somehow he never let her have a baby because the great guru said she wasn't ready ethically and spiritually to birth the child that would save the planet. <laughs> I <is> sicko. She's <laughs> 42 now and childless, which may be a good might be a good thing since she's going to be in prison for her role as a co-conspirator. Well, it might be a good thing also because we really don't need to pass that gene pool down. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, he already has one in Mexico now. Uh, yeah. Renault Rainier told the same thing to Ivy Navaris. I guess she's an, she's another um, second level slave that she would have an avatar baby, a woman who he may diet down to as little as 300 calories a day when oh she God. had an ounce or too much of bad body fat and told her not to cut her hair until she healed her ethical breaches. Her hair grew so long that it went past her feet. She never had a child and was reportedly suicidal when she learned that Mariana had a child in 2017 when she was promised to have one years ago. And keeping with Rainier's class act, the first known child, he forced the mother to tell the Nixium community that the child was a foundling, an orphan whose mother had died giving him birth and whose father was unknown. He not only made the mother deny that he was the father, but forced the mother to deny that her own child was hers, making her pretend that the baby was adopted. He told her to lie because at the time he was pretending to the community that he was, he was a celibate monk. Okay. And I, I, they all believed it. I mean... Rainier made DOS slave Sylvie take naked pictures of herself and had oral sex with her while at the same time ordering her not to have sex with her own husband. How do you get, how do you do that? During V week 2016, Mark Finsante found Rainier in a cabin in bed with a woman with their legs intertwined. V week was an especially randy time for the exalted one. It was his birthday. Hundreds of people, many of them attractive young women came and spent $2,000 or more to be in the woods for 10 days, celebrating his nativity at the silver Bay YMCA. I believe this is all up in Lake George, Mary. Okay. Uh, Claire Brofman would rent the entire 600 acre campus, the late summer air, the Adirondacks, the pines and the oaks, and beautiful Lake George. And on his birthday, he would climb into his birthday suit <laughs> and inveigle as many young wood nymphs as he could as he could do to the same. This is unbelievable. Do we have any idea how much money Claire Bronfman went Bronfman went through altogether? Well, we know it was what two hundred million just in attorney fees. Yeah, right? just in attorney fees, two hundred million. Yeah, but this like, it's like their their whole family fortune went down the tubes. Well, that's why I wanted to find out how were they renewing their expense their expense accounts. Well, because they like like Jenny said, they were collateralizing new people. They were bringing in new people. Yeah, but more people is more mouths to feed. More more people that could. Uh, well, no, they were only eating three hundred calories a day. Well, three, I was going to say three hundred calories a day. I'm sure none of them ever saw a doctor. 
And I, honestly, if, if you're going to give me all of your worldly possessions and all I have to do is feed you, I'm, I'm thinking I'm getting the better end of that deal for sure. Yeah. It's two saltines a day. Well, I think my, my, my puppies get more than 300 calories a day. I'm mm. on a diet right now and, and, and I'm, you know, doing a thousand calories more than that. And, I, and I'm hungry. Hmm. Well, after a certain period of time, your body adjusts and you don't feel hunger anymore. That's correct. Okay. So we're almost to the evidence hearing, which is actually really good. There's good stuff there. Um, but then there's the, his sex lair in Clifton Park with a bed suspended over a hot tub. Poor Kathy Russell, once part of his harem. She, Kathy Russell was the other one with Barbara Boucher and Pam Cabritz was tasked with the job of cleaning the sheets and scrubbing the hot tub. He really just knew how to torture them. So despite court being adjourned on May 14th, there was a discussion about evidence being admitted. Vincente testimony wrapped up on Wednesday and, and they were going to cover the rest of, and circle back to Tuesday since two major things happened that day, even though court was not in session. This is when they discuss the abortion records as well as the evidence on the enemies. Um, the prosecution plans to call law enforcement agent as their third witness um, when Vincente concludes, and they want jurors to see purported financial records of enemies of Nixium, such as federal judges, reporters, Edward Brofman Sr., Rick Ross, various reporters, reporters, they got stuff on reporters, including some from the Albany Times Union, World Jewish Congress, federal judges, Tony Natalie, politicians, political operatives, political consultant Roger Stone, who once worked briefly for Nixium, Buffalo yeah. Beast fixer Steve Pigeon, and Nixium's own lawyers. Um, they considered Roger Stone an enemy, that when he found out what was going on, he started making noise about them, and that's why he was an enemy. Just to pry that piece out. So they then sought anyone who was a liability <coughs> and enemy. a third on them. Yes. And they used all the forces of legal um, availability against them. To try to get leverage. Correct. That was, yeah, that's an enemy. These records were found at Nancy Salzman's house when the FBI, during its raid on March 27, 2018, found them in a plastic box. A half million dollars was also found and seized from Salzman's house. It appears that the Canadian investigative firm Canaprobe provided some of these records and was in itself perpetrating a fraud on Nixium. Rainier's attorney, Mark Agon, I'm going to get his name right eventually, Agonophilio, said the bank records produced by Canaprobe were bogus. Uh, Canaprobe was sued by the Brofmans in Montreal for providing bogus financial records for which the sisters paid the company $1 million to spy on enemies, a million, and perceived enemies. There is a fair chance the financial records were indeed bogus since two subcontractors of Canaprobe went to federal prison for faking financial records for other clients for Canaprobe. There were also emails from two email accounts one of which had been created by Emiliano Salinas, that's the Mexican connection, and one created by Kristen Keefe for Rainier, that the prosecution wants to admit as evidence. Keefe was legal liaison for Nixium before she left with her son, also Rainier's son, in 2014, making her the first member of Rainier's inner, inner circle to defect from him. His other inner inner circle, Pam Kafritz and Barbara Jeske, died in 2016 and 2014. People believe it's because they made them keep their their weight so low that their health oh, yeah. and that they uh, ended up getting very vicious, aggressive cancer from that. Now, you've, you're yeah. way ahead of everyone, but I want to know, has any evidence been submitted that any of the offspring were DNA matched up i i have not seen any of that yet okay because that would be not. because that would be supportive evidence proving yes. that the testimonies are right on with that yes. something factual right yeah i haven't 
I haven't seen anything about that at all. Maybe they're going to listen to our broadcast and they'll go, snap, I should have thought of that. Yeah, what a great idea, right? Exactly. <laughs> Emma saves the day. Oh, my gosh. So Keith has a son with Rainier and said she left to protect her son from the diabol diabolical influence of Rainier. She has since become a whistleblower and provided damning information to law enforcement and attorneys about Rainier's crimes. Well, and, he and here's something that I could just as a professional interject. It's so true that women will take anything, all levels of abuse and every everything under the sun that a man can level on them. But as soon as there are children involved, it's a game changer. Yeah. Yep. Well, Keith also tried to, uh, Keith, it sounds like Keith, it, it's not. It's Kristen that we're talking about here. Kristen right. Keith. Um, she also tried to warn Nixian leaders via email that Rainier was going to get them all indicted due to his criminal behavior. This was back in 2014, 15, and her words today seem prophetic since five other Nixian members were indicted and have pled guilty. Um, Assistant U.S. Attorney Maura Penza said she wa wants to admit the two collections <laughs> of emails in the accounts she said are entirely criminal. So everything in the emails is entirely criminal and it implicates uh, Emiliana Salinas. And I, I'm stressing that because we're hopefully going to get to this on episode three. <laughs> <laughs> so here was a great deal of material and the defense said that the prosecution was bringing a dump truck full of prob problematic evidence into the courtroom. <coughs> Defense said they were only informed at 1 a.m. last night about these materials being introduced as evidence. There was some pushback from the prosecution because even though there was some communication at 1 a.m., the defense has had the materials for some time. Agnifilio said this is not the type of evidence that can just be jumped, dumped on a jury's lap. They're making a judgment decision, not a call, because they're afraid of the cross-examination, and maybe they should be. Mr. Agnifilio is the one afraid of Kristen Keefe because the defendant tortured her. This is in quotes, Penza responded. That's why he hasn't spoken to her. They don't want her on the stand. She was completely tortured. The next topic that Vincente testified was the Rainbow Cultural Gardens, RCG. Um, this is an unlicensed daycare operation and an unlicensed school where children were taught in different language by a different person every day. And there was a chain of them. It wasn't just one. What was the purpose? What was the purpose of those schools? Um, I think it was more a mind, um, a mind. They, they were, yeah, like, like, yeah. There's a lot of mind experiences that uh, experiments that they're going to start getting into. Mm -hmm. well, that were, just wanted to kind of open that can of worms a little bit. Yeah, I, I think that had a lot to do with it. How the children reacted to that. Um, they ended up battling. Not they didn't do well with this program. The children who went in it. But Keith did say any of his own children were allowed to go into this very expensive program for 50% uh, off. Oh, isn't that great? What a um, guy. <laughs> so that was, this is still Vincente. He then talks about films they were going to make, including one showing an ex-cult members who had left and later died of suicide because they were doing so due to their covert drug activities outside of the cult. <coughs> I guess to explain the other two suicides that he couldn't explain in case it ever came out, let's make a movie about it to go ahead and explain it to people, even though this will be totally fiction. He then discussed how Keith asked Mark to edit old videotapes to take things out. Keith was constantly filming himself. And I think we're on the final day of him. Uh, there was no ruling for the record on yesterday's evidentiary matter concerning whether Kristen Keefe will be required to testify as part of the trove of documents seized from Nancy Salzman's house, which the prosecution hopes to introduce through a law enforcement agency. As for today, May 15th, 
Mark Finsante continued his testimony through much of the morning. Cross-examination did not start around noon. He testified about how he split from Rainier. He began by telling about Sarah, Sarah Edmondson. There is a podcast on her at CBC Podcast that's worth reviewing. She gives many details of her rise in Nixium. She was a star recruiter and recruited over 2,000 people with her boyfriend. They were considered a super couple within Nixium. Uh, Mark, Mark's wife had already left the cult at this time, and Sarah had been sent, sent in to handle the wife. You got to get the wife back in. Mark had gone to Keith to express he wanted to also leave, to which Keith offered Mark to become the next vanguard and take his place. <laughs> Vincente brought up to Sarah his concerns that there was a secret society. Sarah said if something like that existed, the person involved wouldn't be able to talk about it. This comment from Sarah didn't register with Vincente right away. Then in the discussion with Kayla, someone observed on Allison Mack's computer that Mack had pledged collateral that if she was to ever leave Rainier, she would give up any children she had and surrender all of her possessions to him. This is when Mark starts to see Nixium for what it is. Sarah said again that if someone was involved in a secret society of this sort, they couldn't say anything about it. Vincente realizing what he was hearing and said, Sarah, have you been invited to be in this thing? Sarah got quiet. Then she admitted she was part of it. She can't tell him that because it's supposed to be a secret. <laughs> she did. Oh, well. Vincente said, get out. Sarah said, I can't. They have too much on me. Vincente said, well, what do they have on you? Sarah described her collateral. Vincente said, you're involved in something illegal. This could be trafficking. Vincente pressed her. Sarah admitted she had been branded. She was hiding all this from her husband, Anthony Ames. She couldn't leave. She had to enroll other women. She felt trapped. She had a lack of sleep. Because so her husband didn't notice she was branded? That's, I just, I know, right? Same thing. It speaks volumes about that marriage. She well, had it, oh, it, makes no, it makes no sense. In other words, it, a branding is rather obvious. Yeah. And, and no matter where they put it on her body, you would think that the husband would have access to that body part. Yeah, it says a lot about the marriage. <laughs> well, or, or she, in, in, her, in, in her whole collateralization, she vowed not to have sex with her husband. And it's not tattooed. On well, at this point, Sarah was not having um sex with Rainier, just so you know. Okay, just so you know, she had not gotten to that point yet. That doesn't mean that she wasn't told she couldn't sleep with her husband, she had just gotten branded. She wasn't, she thought she was in the inner circle of this women's group with just Lauren. And what's so amazing about the CB, uh, the podcast that I referred you back to, she goes through and she describes how hurt she was by Lauren Salzman. Lauren was her best friend. She trusted her. She pushed through her branding and then found out what had to happen. with. And it was that point she got out and she got out and she started whistleblowing before other women started getting branding, knowing then what they were about to get into. So she escaped Nixium prior to being forced to have sex with Rainier. Um, so Sarah admitted she had been branded. She was hiding all this from her <coughs> husband. She couldn't leave. She had to enroll other women. She felt trapped. She had lack of sleep. So she was still on readiness drills where they text you and you have to answer within a certain amount of time your master. Otherwise, you, you get a, a consequence. Sarah admitted she did have a master. Her master was Lauren Salzman. And Sarah did make reference to a master-slave relationship. Then Sarah showed Vincente an image of the brand, which was displayed on the screen in the courthouse. I think most of us have seen this. If you, or it's one of the most common images. It, it was on the front cover of the New York Times. Um, Vincente, right, and, and to refresh this, it isn't just a brand like you would brand a cow. No, it's corduroy. 
it's done with a cauterizing yeah. instrument similar to a soldering iron image uh -huh. and, it is, and it is hand it is hand uh, pressed into the skin the burning flesh so that they're not going to be identical but they also get them on tape saying, yes, master, please brand me. It would be an honor Ugh. before they're branded. This way they can't ever say it was consensual. Um, so Vincente realized at this point he might have put his wife and mother in danger because he brought them in too, right? So in the letters he gave as the reason for resigning that he wanted to work on his career as a filmmaker. And that was half true, but he didn't want to set off alarm bells. He didn't discuss anything about a slave society. He was worried also and asked Claire to revoke his access to the Nixium computer system because he was concerned he could be charged with illegally accessing something there as others had been charged through Claire Brofman's perjury. So they would just, whatever they could come up with. Um, Vincente went to Catherine no last name is given, but we all know it's Oxenberg, India's mm -hmm. mother, um, to share his concerns about Catherine's daughter, India. And to say that the daughter was in danger, for she was also a member of DOS and was branded. <clears throat> and now we begin the cross-examination of Mark Vincente. Agonophilia was trying to paint Keith in the best light and impeach Vincente. Vincente held up pretty well. Agonophilio questioned Vincente on matters he already testified about. Vincente elaborated on the Nixium 9 that they left in 2009, causing changes to Nixium's executive board. Vincente testified how the Nixium 9, led by Barbara Boucher and Susan Dones, were asking for money they said was owed to them, and Vincente and others were told this was an extortion attempt. Vincente was questioned about a letter he sent to the Saratoga County DA seeking Boucher's prosecution on extortion. In the letter, Vincente wrote to Boucher, damaged the company and his ability to enroll people. Vincente was questioned about Fiji. He admitted he took trips to Fiji. They owned an island there. Ag <laughs> they owned an island. Agonophilia was able to elicit that Vincente went willingly and took photos and videos there. How close is that to Epstein Island, do you know? Um, isn't Epstein in the Caribbean? This is in Fiji. Yeah, Fiji is all the way on the other side of the world. Okay. But I mean, it don't, don't think for one second that that's not connected to this. Of course. Yeah, don't even, don't think that that, we're just not there yet. Um, Vincente admitted he didn't have to pay for accommodation and his only cost was food. Agonophilio suggested Vincente enjoyed Fiji and had a great time on the beaches. And Vincente said, I never said I had a bad time. His moment that stands out the most under cross-examination was um, at the beginning of sessions, students and instructors would put on their sashes. They had different sashes met different levels of them in the leadership position. Uh, and they would gather into a huddle proclaiming, we are committed to our success, Vincente said. Then they would read Rainier's 12-point mission statement. The prosecutor asked Vincente to read the statement. The second line states, there are no ultimate victims here. Therefore, I will not choose to be a victim. Vincente broke down crying on the witness stand. And he said, it's a fraud. It's a lie. This is a, a well-intended veneer that covers horrible, incredible evil. And that ends Vincente's testimony. So. That's, that's like, uh, it's just so crazy. His, his, I give these people credit for even coming forward. Because it's, oh, you know, it reads it reads like a uh, an evil, diabolical, trashy novel, and to be confronted with this that this is testimony in a court in front of a jury. No wonder they're not making this available to the public, you know, to come and go. I think we could probably get the um, the ruling on the abortion records admittance on this one, and then mm -hmm. we'll try to shoot for the 
Carla yeah. Lim on the next one. Yeah. Um, this was just, oh, I had said I was going to circle back after we finished up Mark's because I wanted to keep it clean because this one's really important. Um, Rainier submitted a motion to preclude the introduction of all evidence pertaining to abortions. He evidently ordered dozens of abortions for the women he ruled and the government wants to introduce that as evidence of the kind of racketeering enterprise he led. I'm surprised he didn't have his own clinic. Maybe. Yeah. He had to have doctors under his wing. They did. They had a doctor come who taught them how to use the cauterizing pen. Right. <laughs> no sense whatsoever. Because <laughs> uh, not, I, I know no doctors that would ever do that. It's first do no harm. Um, Rainier argues that the introduction of evidence pertaining to abortions would serve solely to inflame the jury because abortion is one of the most contested issues facing the country. But Judge Nicholas Gafarius ruled he will not exclude all evidence on abortions. He reserved judgment on one particular thorny bit of evidence concerning an abortion for Camellia. The 15-year-old girl Rainier photographed nude in 2005 when she was 18. The government contends the evidence that Camilla had an abortion when she was 18 helps prove he had a sexual relationship with her before she was 18. The government has medical records of Camilla's abortion. These records include images of pregnancy tests and sonogram photos. I think we've said this, but we're going to say it again. Rainier was known to require his women to carry a sonogram photos of their unborn baby or fetus he had ordered aborted. The late Pam Cavritz, for instance, desperately wanted to have a baby, but was repeatedly ordered to abort by Rainier. One time after an abortion, he ordered her to carry around the sonogram pictures in her purse for some time. Now think about this. All of these services for abortions and whatever must have had to have been done off the record and cash because you don't hear you know any of that that would go through an insurance company or anything that might go through any kind of other funding it doesn't seem like i mean they're they're trying to establish all these records with evidence that would be where see you know, you've got a sonogram that had to be by someone who could create that kind of a service you don't normally you don't just get a copy of your sonogram Right. You just don't go into a, it's not like a drive through. <laughs> no, that's actually, that's, that's what they do. They, there's a sonogram. You can request it or it stays in your file. No, so it, what it's she's saying, the process. They, there had to be some kind of professionals involved in all of that because you, you can't just, you know, go buy a sonogram machine and take pictures. You need somebody who knows how to do all of that. You know, the, the medical industry has checks and balances within it where you don't just hand somebody, you know, like a hundred dollar bill and say, hi, I need a sonogram. And the doctor takes it and puts it in his white coat. I'm sure that there are places, you know, on the shady side that might do that. So the connections that they're trying to make in this case are, they're not hitting on any doctor records. We're talking about superficial mm -hmm. things that somebody was able to produce, a sonogram. Well, the sonogram had to be taken by somebody, and that somebody had to be affiliated with some sort of training and, and a location. You see what I'm saying? I'm not hearing any of that being developed in the court case yet so far. And I know I'm going to really go into the weeds here, but do we know what kind of, I was trying to find it, what kind of uh, cancer? Uh, Pam Caffritz died from because multiple abortions, hello, mm -hmm. uh, was it uterine? Was it ovarian? Was it, you know, female cancer? It's at the top of one of these that I have. I'm just curious to know what, you know, they say cancer, cancer. they didn't say what kind. Yeah. Just curious, you know, because that, that could also lead to some kind of legal. That's a big range. Mm -hmm. So there are records to chase down there that we're not hearing or being introduced yet. So the judge writes in his memo that Camilla's, AKA Jane Doe number two, medical records also contain a statement to the effect that Jane Doe two had been with her current partner for five years at the time of her abortion. Wow, that puts her at 13. That would put her at 13. 
By the way, Rainier was 43 years old at the time. Okay. This is a big revelation. Let's do the math. Camilla was 18 when she had her abortion. She said she had been with her partner, Rainier, for five years. That would mean she was 13 when Rainier first had sex with her. This is two years before he took nude pictures of her when she was 15. Camilla is not expected to testify. According to the prosecution, she remains in Nixium. According to our sources, this is, uh, I believe this one's from the Frank Report. According to our sources, she is living in Guadalajara and working for Nixium. She is now 29. What is, what is Nixium actively engaged in at this point? Oh, they're still very active. Like you even were on the website the other night for Jeunesse. Well, I was on Jeunesse, right. I mean, you think about it, when they still have all this collateral and power over people that's just slowly becoming unraveled and not even really being shined into the public, of course they're still going to op be in operation. Well, no, because the minute you have established in a federal court and you might have something affiliated with, say, say under the RICO statute, you can shut them down and confiscate. Yeah, you can, how are they not shut yeah, down? You can, Thank you. you. Yeah, you can, free, you can freeze everything until it's sorted out. How are they not shut down? Now, I can understand if it's in another country. Well, I will tell you this, even though I hate skipping around, I like covering it in order. The Rainbow School was shut down um, just last week in Mexico City. The child, illegal child care place. Uh -huh. So there are starts, uh, some parts of it that are starting to fold, but... You know, it's just like drug dealers. You get rid of one and then there's two more ready to fall in their spot. The note on her abortion records says she stated she was with her partner for five years. It cannot be used to prosecute Vanguard for statutory rape since this is hearsay. The judge ruled that evidence on abortion can be admitted, but on Camilla and her damning note, the judge reserved judgment. He will rule on the admissibility of the notation in Jane Doe II's medical file about her having been with Rainier for five years until after the government has had an opportunity to lay this foundation and place these records in their full context. So he's reserving the right to. Uh... So he's, with, he's withholding he's withholding his uh, his judgment on that matter right now. Yes. But that was also in front of the jury, was it not? Or was this no, this was this was all done during the hearing when they were it was just the two attorneys with the judge. They were trying to make the this was on May 14th that I wanted to circle back. Right. Um, because I felt that this piece needed to stand alone after we did Mark Finsante, and that's why I got a little out of order there. Mm -hmm. Um this yeah, was jury, the day. now imagine this. The jury's been impaneled for many weeks now. Yes. But yet they have not been sequestered, correct? I believe they are sequestered. I believe they are. They're keeping this trial on serious lockdown. Well, they you can you can sequester the jury, or you can allow them with a warning, just not to review anything that might be discuss, right. Right. Not not discuss nor any internet research or anything like that. Depends on what the judge. I would say. Can you imagine putting those people into a hotel <laughs> for several months? Okay, so this is probably a great place to put a period at the end of this. The other thing that was revealed at that, that hearing that they had without the trial there, um, <coughs> buried in the transcript of Tuesday's hearing, which they had only received mid-afternoon, they're very behind on getting the transcripts, was the startling revelation that the government alleges that Emiliano Salinas, the son of Carlos Salinas, the former president of Mexico, is a co-conspirator in this case. And even with lead prosecutor Moira Kim Penz's flat out declaration on Tuesday, so quote unquote, so one of the email accounts appears to have been created by Emiliano Salinas, who the government alleges is a co-conspirator. It appears that no other media outlet has reported anything regarding this aspect of the case. We, being Frank Report, because I want to give them credit for using their stuff, <laughs> previously reported that according to our source in Washington, D.C., discussions were ongoing between the Carlos Slim Foundation 
and the Clinton Foundation about a multi-million dollar payment being negotiated or already negotiated. Possibly it is to be added to an amount previously contributed and increased now due to the severity of the situation. <laughs> well, the only thing I can find right now uh, on the status of the jury is that they're trying to make sure they're only given numbers and not names and that right. all that information will never be revealed. That I just, yeah, I just pulled that up. They're what they're calling them semi sequestered. And they're going to supposed to be uh, completely anonymous. I don't know how that's even conceivable because two people can keep a secret if one of them's dead, but that's where it's at. So that's, so that's, that's something we're going to look at. Okay, I'll put that on my to-do list. What's the status of the jury? Well, we'll yeah. find out the status of the jury. You said it was semi. Semi sequestered. Uh, you know, and I've never heard of semi sequestered. I mean, you either are or you're not. Well, that's, yeah, that's the term that they use, the semi sequestered. So I don't know. It's, it's conceivable that the jurors may not be in the actual courtroom. Well, I'll tell you, you want to know who's really going bonkers over this? Was when I, there's a couple different ways that I've been consuming my information on this. I will go to, of course, the Frank Report. Artvoice.com is another great source. Um, there's some podcasts out there that are very interesting. What's really great about the Frank Report is not only are they getting the transcripts and putting the information up pretty quickly, but in the comment section, a lot of the people who've escaped mixing, like the Barbara Boucher's, they're commenting. <laughs> So you're getting a really insider view over there and getting a, a, a good picture of what's happening. Um, I also have two people on Twitter that I follow, including Ayla Fiera. She's a few days behind, but again, they're having a really hard time getting the transcripts from the court. So mm -hmm. it's taking them a little while. And then there's one other woman, but I, can, I put in Nixium into the search bar and I click top and then latest. At some point, I believe it was what, day three, right after this hearing. So that's going to put us on in, at the end of the first week. When they start, all of a sudden, everything turns to Spanish. Oh, sorry. Every post was Spanish when I looked up Nixium. What is going on? So I started clicking around and looking, and I was using it. It automatically will translate the, the page for you. The Mexican media is all over this all over this we're not not here in america but the mexican media and the mexican people are completely all over this case crazy very crazy and so on that note we're going to conclude with episode number two on coast to coast of the nixium trial of keith Rainier. and we hope to bring it back to you with another episode have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night.